central nervous system. I think you will find that if you compare notes to somebody else in a different professor's uh, lecture, that we all kind of pick what we want to talk about in the central nervous system. Um, the brain is so complicated, and we're just learning stuff about it more and more and more. There, you can't just say this part of the brain does this and that's it. You can't say that you'll only find information about this in this part of the brain. So, in other words, although there are primary areas that do primary things, other parts of the brain are going to help that primary part out. Um, the book gets into a lot of detail. I would say probably the things um, that, in general, that you should know are listed on this, this page. And although some people might get into, um, some of the professors you might know get into sleep, or some people might get into, say, Broca's area, or... Um, uh, Wernicke to area. Um, I'm not going to get into that. I'm I'm probably going to be the weirdo that picks the limbic system because in general, when people are stressed out and they do things that maybe they usually wouldn't do, or that they they do it but then they feel bad about it, it's because they have been system and you, we've all done it we've all said things that we wish we hadn't said and we've all done things that we wonder uh, was that the right response or maybe you've just wondered about somebody why in the world would somebody say something like that that's probably going to be your limbic system I find it very interesting and frustrating at the same time uh, but anyway the important basic anatomy of the central nervous system is listed here, and um, I'm trying to incorporate lecture with lab. So I'm going to go through these things um, one by one and hopefully highlight also lab. Okie dokie. This is a cut through, uh, through the brain. This is a real brain, and some, the next slide actually has the model. So some things that are on here that are also in your lab book, the corpus callosum, the thalamus, the fourth ventricle, the cerebellum, the pons, the medulla oblongata, the hypothalamus, and the third ventricle. So on this right here, um, I encourage you to look at your lab book. This is, this is the actual model that you will likely be tested on. And um, let's see. The outside of your brain, the wrinkled part, your cerebral cortex, that is actually gray matter. Maybe you've seen some TV show something, whatever, police show where somebody has been killed and they say, oh, his gray matter was all over the ground. So they broke the skull in this part of the brain. <laughs> I know this sounds gruesome, but uh, just try to come up with things to help you remember. Remember, gray matter is going to be cell bodies and um, unmyelinated axons. White matter is going to be myelinated axons. So if you see white, it's myelin. Myelin has a lot of fat in it. Um, let's see. In the brain, the gray matter is on the outside, and the white matter is kind of tucked in on the inside. In the spinal cord, the gray matter is on the inside. And then the outside, the more uh, superficial part of the spinal cord, the white matter is on the outside. So brain, gray matter, outside, white matter, inside, in areas. And then spinal cord, the gray matter is actually that little butterfly in the middle, surrounded by white matter. Okay, so the cerebrum. The cerebrum 
is where we have all of our thought processes. It's very comp complex. Um, the more wrinkles a, a creature has, the more intelligent it is. Um, so it's not the size of the brain. It's how many wrinkles you have. Um, the, the cortex is all that wrinkled part. We do have a left and a right side, and the left side does control the right side of the body and vice versa. They're connected. The left and right hemispheres are connected by that corpus callosum, which is um, that white area that's surrounding the majority of the third ventricle. We have different lobes. This is nice and easy because it's just like with the, the skull bones. You have a frontal lobe. You have parietal lobes on either side. You have temporal lobes on either side. An occipital lobe in the back. And here's a couple of extra new things I'm going to introduce. The hippocampus and the amygdala. If you're in psychology, you probably have already heard of these. Okay, if you read your book, you're going to see that there's going to be a whole lot more detail in these lobes. Um, but I, I just pulled this out of the lab book. So we're just going to stick straight with the lab book on this. Again, your lecture book has so much in, in, uh, material. Um, and that's great, but um, you could spend years <laughs> studying the nervous system and learning all the things there are to that we know right now with the brain. So the frontal lobes... And, and the lobes actually mix up exactly, this, or mesh up just exactly as the bones do. So the frontal bone is, for, is where your frontal lobe is, parietal lobes, you have one on either side, temporal lobe matches up with the temporal bone, occipital lobe matches up with the occipital bone. The frontal lobe um, is, that is, for one thing, he's in charge of motor of the skeletal muscle, but the frontal lobe is what makes us be able to focus. The frontal lobe is what makes us make good choices. Um, it also plays a role in personality and verbal communication. And again, I'm going to show you some other things with personality. Um, it does a lot. The parietal lobe is going to be all about sensory. So sensory and touch, how you perceive what you felt, and then expression of emotion. Again, you'll see expression of emotion, personality, they all mesh up. So um, I think what I have highlighted in black is from your lab book. Um, temporal lobe is going to be all about sounds, which makes sense, because that guy is... Um, where in the bones, the temporal bone is where you have the petrous portion that's housing and taking care of your middle ear bones and your inner ear. Um, also plays a role in smell, understanding speech. Very important, the occipital lobe is all about visual interpretation. What do you see? Did you know? Your brain is not done developing till you're about 25 years old. The last part to develop is the part that makes you make good choices, the part that helps you focus, the part that helps you learn from mistakes. Um, so it's, it's called the prefrontal cortex. Um, and this is why a 16-year-old driver is not as good as an 18-year-old driver, is not as good as a 30-year-old driver. Um, car insurance, or if you want to rent a car, uh, you'll notice a big price difference once you hit 25 years old. And this is because of this genuine fact. And, um, you know, we're all, all still learning each and every day of, the, of our lives, but... Um, before 25 years old, there's definitely more lessons to be learned that, um, that can help us be better people and help us focus more. All right, so below that wrinkledy part right there is uh, at, the, at about the area of each temporal lobe is an amygdala and a hippocampus. Um, the amygdala 
is the area where we ex feel intense emotion, especially those that we really don't like. The things that make us so anxious, the things that make us so fearful, the things that make us maybe say things that we wish we hadn't have said before. Um, the hippocampus is in charge of long-term memory. And the whole thing is part of the limbic system. There's more than the amygdala and the hippocampus, and I have it written down at the bottom. Don't memorize that. Um, but the, the limbic system is the area that we're trying to use higher mental function to control our primitive caveman emotions. So, um, whatever, your, your significant other makes you mad. Um, maybe let's do the, you asked your child or your spouse to put out the trash 10 times, 10 times, 10 times. And they didn't put out the trash and the trash goes and it's 105 degrees in Texas and you don't have any more room in your trash can and it stinks and it's attracting dogs and you really want to scream and holler or maybe worse. But you know better. You know better than to go off like a caveman and attack them. Uh, maybe you decide, okay, well, there needs to be a consequence to this. So, whatever, to, to put the trash in their bed, I don't know. But you get the idea. <laughs> uh, anyway, what's going to happen is the limbic system is, gonna, is going to interact with your prefrontal cortex to help you respond properly. But sometimes, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes you just get hijacked by that amygdala and something comes out you just wish, man, I wish I hadn't said that. And, and, and it's too late. It's out. You just apologize and move on. Uh, <laughs> it is located on top of the brain stem. So here's a picture of the entire limbic system. Um, the horseshoe looking thing, I wish I could have a pointer, uh, but the most, let's say the most superior part that's looping around like a sea, hippocampus is actually Greek for um, seahorse, that's how he gets its name. Um, the thalamus, I, I mentioned the thalamus in the, um, when we were when I was pointing out those different pictures, that the thalamus is in the uh, middle. But what all you can see with the cut through from the uh, mid sagittal cut of the brain is just where the two little eggs of the thalamus are connected. So it's actually called an intrathalamic adhesion. Don't memorize that. But you can't really appreciate the size of the thalami from that model. This picture, of course, is trying to depict a three-dimensional picture. Um, this is the area that um, does things that make you more fearful than somebody else. So, no, well, maybe some people like spiders. I don't know. I don't. But maybe some people really don't like spiders. But some people lose their mind over a spider. That's this area right here. Okay, so fear is normal. It's there to protect us so that we can recognize, let's say you're looking down a dark alley and you go, oh, I don't get a good feeling about that. Let's move on. That's normal. That's created in us to keep us safe. A phobia is an intense and irrational fear, even though something really isn't going to hurt you, like the poor spider that's in the corner of your room that maybe he just got in because it was raining and there's a crack in the wall or whatever and the spider is not going to kill you. But maybe you flip out or maybe a snake you know, or maybe a mouse or some people are afraid of birds. Um, so if you overreact to the presence of something, that would be a phobia. Um, amygdalar disorders are actually... Um, not uncommon at all. What leads to a panic attack is going to be an amygdala disorder. 
Um, so your brain perceives that there's a terrible threat and, you know, you might, whatever, die. And uh, you go into hyperventilation. Some, some more common ones that you've probably heard of, I have PTSD highlighted um, because we are definitely in a time where our soldiers have a, a different kind of combat, the, the hidden enemy. It's a lot different from World War I and World War II. And, um, you know, once we hit Vietnam uh, War, Korean War, there was a whole lot more sniper type activity which puts you on high strain, you're on, on guard all the time. And so a lot of these poor soldiers come back with PTSD. Maybe you've heard of obsessive compulsive disorder, borderline personality disorder. Um, these are all amygdala disorders. Okay, the third ventricle, the ventricles have cerebral spinal fluid in them. Um, so they're a pocket. The outside of the third ventricle pocket is going to be, so what makes up the walls is going to be called the diencephalon. So output from the cerebrum passes through this area, um, except olfactory, and it, con it contains the thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary, pineal glands. Um, the thalamus on the lab model you can't really see it because the, the lab models are cross mid-sagittal cross sections. So like the previous couple of slides ago, you could see the two eggs that were kind of stuck together as the thalamus. Well, what he's important for is sensory information, except smell, sensory information stops at the thalamus and then the thalamus sends an association neuron out to different parts of the brain to decide what to do with that sensation. So uh, you'll have that unipolar sensory neuron who enters into the spinal cord, and maybe, maybe the whole thing makes it up to the thalamus, maybe not, maybe he meets an association neuron, but they're, except for smell, it's all gonna make a pit stop at the thalamus. And then the thalamus decides uh, where all that information is gonna go. Most of it's going to be a divergent path. So you've got that one area in the thalamus putting out all kinds of neurons to different parts of the brain because we're complex creatures. And maybe we, uh, maybe we know that we should run and get away from it, but maybe your prefrontal cortex decides to analyze the whole situation before that, or you get the idea. The hypothalamus is so important. He is, first of all, he's going to be in charge of homeostasis. He is a neurological organ and he is an endocrine organ. He also helps regulate temperature. So when you get a virus like the flu virus and your body recognizes, I need to cook this guy out, so what he does is he resets normal. He creates that fever. And initially, what do you feel? When you, when you uh, are first getting sick, you get the chills because just 10 minutes ago, your body was supposed to be 98.6. Now your brain says you're supposed to be 101. So at 98.6, you're cold. You have the chills. Now when you hit 101, and then you suffer through it, and you've made it through the virus, and you know you you're, you're, you've passed the chills. You're you feel feverish. You feel hot and achy. Now let's say we've cooked out the flu. Flu's deceased. He has left your body. Now your brain says, "Okay, we can go back to ninety eight point six. Well, your body temperature is still one hundred and one, but your brain is saying you should be ninety eight point six. This is when you start sweating." When you, your fever breaks and you start sweating because you're hot compared to what your brain says you should be. There you go. That's the hypothalamus. It's that kind of a sideways W that you can see at the um, 
the ventral part of the of the third ventricle. Sorry, not the ventricle. I got I'm so used to doing dogs cats. Not ventral part, it is the inferior part. Okay, pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is sitting in the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. And the pituitary gland is under control of the hypothalamus. So that's why it's dangling off of the hypothalamus. If you were lucky enough to ever see one of the brains that had a pituitary gland still attached to it, then you know what I'm talking about. But honestly, the pituitary gland usually gets knocked off. Everybody plays with it and it just falls off so easy after these models. Um, he produces many, 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 many hormones and you'll learn about him more in amputee. And then the pineal gland is um, inferior and posterior in the wall of the third ventricle. And he produces melatonin and he's in charge of regulating your sleep. So here's a picture showing these guys. Remember, this is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object. That pituitary should be coming out uh, towards you off of the screen uh, because it's kind of dangling down below the hypothalamus. Okay, the brainstem. So the brainstem, the most superior part of the brainstem is, a mid, is the midbrain. And it's actually quite a nondescript uh, area. So um, honestly, it, the pons is very obvious. It looks like a little pregnant belly. Um, so if you go above the pons, that's the midbrain. And if you go below the pons, that's the medulla oblongata. The brainstem is in charge of your basic functions. So when you hear that somebody is brain, brain dead, but their brainstem is still alive, they can't think. They can't hear, they can't see, but they still have these vital areas that help make the heart beat, make respiration still happen, um, change blood pressure, but for all practical purposes, they're not with us anymore. So we have, so reflexive type behavior. Okay, so the midbrain, this is all from your lab book. The midbrain is in charge of vision and hearing reflexes. The pons helps relay information between the cortex and the cerebellum. Um, he does also play a role in REM sleep and a secondary role in respiration. But if you go below to the medulla oblongata, this guy is so important with keeping you alive. So he is your respiration. He is your blood pressure. So it's called vasomotor because in your lab book, he lets the vessels move. The smooth, muscle in the, the smooth muscle in the vessel can uh, relax, and that's vasodilation, or it can contract, and that's vasoconstriction. When your vessels get wider in diameter or tighter in diameter, that changes your blood pressure. Just like having a hose open or kinked off. If you kink off a hose, you know the water starts spraying out at a higher pressure. Not completely kinked off, of course. But if you just put your finger over the edge of the hose, you have changed the diameter of the, of the end of the hose. So the water starts spraying. That's what happens to your blood pressure, except usually it's going to be the vessels constricting or, of course, plaques building up from high-fat diets. Um, when, a, when a neck um, breaks, you know, with some, some sort of tragic event or maybe some sort of um, mobster TV show where somebody actually snaps somebody's neck. The medulla oblongata is coming off of the brain stem into the cervical region. So snapping the neck bones can also rip the medulla oblongata and that would cause instant death. The cerebellum. So that's that cool little um, almost circular area that when you cut through it, you can see the, looks like a tree, um, and it's called the VK Arboretum. The cerebellum is in charge of um, balance and fine muscle movement, so people that play the piano have a bigger cerebellum. Uh, I guess I should say if they're good at it. Um, 
And um, this video here is, I can't play it, but you can. Um, it's depicting a cat who has a very poorly de developed cerebellum. So there's viruses in cats that you vaccinate for, but if mom gets sick with this while she's pregnant, her kittens will have very underdeveloped cerebellum. So if you watch this video, what you're seeing is cerebellar disease. Um, this kitty, by the way, does not hurt at all. So um, this kitty is happy. And the biggest problem with this cat is if he were to try and jump up on high things, he could hurt himself and fall off because he doesn't have good control of his muscle movements. He doesn't have good balance. But I encourage you to watch that. And don't feel sorry for the kitty. And the kitty did get a home. Okay. Um, blood supply to the brain. So we're going to have a combination of those vertebral arteries that are passing through those transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae. Remember the cervical vertebrae have holes on either side. The purpose of those holes is for arteries to pass through. And they're very protective. They're coming off of the subclavians. And then we also have a branch off of the common carotid called the internal carotid. And together, the internal carotid and the vertebral arteries are going to give blood to the brain. They're going to be patterned in something called a circle of Willis. And I have a picture in the next slide. Um, Venus return, what's going to happen is we have a series of these like thin walled pockets that's going to collect um, deoxygenated blood um, from the capillaries. And these sinuses eventually are going to empty into the jugular vein. Um, so here's the circle of Willis. You can appreciate I have the two starred areas where we have the internal carotids coming together, the vertebral arteries, if you can appreciate they're deep. And the reason that they're deep is because the, the cervical vertebrae are deep inside the body. It's all going to come up to that little circle. What happens if you get a block in the blood supply to your brain? Well, then you could have a stroke. And uh, stroke used to just be fast. They would say, okay, memorize fast. So if you see somebody with um, facial drooping on one side, so an uneven face, um, one arm won't elevate, so they, they feel tingling or numbness or the inability to elevate their arm, speech is slurred, and then uh, T is, time is of essence. You can actually, if it's a, um, it's a small window, but if you can get to the hospital, they can give you something to dissolve the clot and um, prevent a lifelong paralysis kind of thing. Now, they very recently have changed it to B fast. So B has to do with balance. If somebody looks like they're getting a little bit drunk, and then they usually people having a stroke will say something about having a blurriness of vision. About half of nursing home patients have had a stroke. Um, so it's super, super common. And maybe you've heard of a TIA. It's, that stands for transient ischemic attack. Ischemia is lack of blood supply. But it's transient, which means that it was, that little clot was just passing through and it was temporary. So I'll tell you a story. My brother-in-law was working from home and he was at his office and he looked out the window and he saw his neighbor, um, a pest control person had just pulled up. So the truck parks, and then all of a sudden he finds himself on the floor waking up, and he looks as the truck, as the uh, pest control truck is driving away. So he lost that section of time. Went to the hospital, lots and lots and lots of tests run. They can find nothing wrong, and they diagnose him with a TIA. So there was a plug, there was a little clot, maybe it dissolved, probably dissolved, could have just slipped and moved on and it was tiny enough that it didn't cause a problem anywhere uh, past that, but it's gone. 
so you can't see it on any testing. Okay, so we always have to have some connective tissues, right? And I told you that the Christi Galli is anchoring the meninges, which is the connective tissue wrap that's protecting the brain. Well, what I didn't tell you is that that meninges has three layers. So the outermost layer is really tough. It's called the dura mater. And that's actually what the Christi Galli is anchored to is the dura mater. That's Latin for tough mother. Um, it's very, very thick. Um, if you were to cut it with scissors, it, it, it actually, you know, it sounds like you're cutting paper or something for lack of a better term. Um, then deep to the dura mater, you have something called a retinoid mater. And this is the area where we're going to have the cerebral spinal fluid. And then the serous membrane that is directly touching all those gyri and dipping into all those sulci is called pia mater. Um, I'm going to show you the difference between an epidural and a spinal tap because it has to do with the location of the needle based on the meninges. This picture right here is a drawing, but you can appreciate how there is the grayish part towards the bottom of the drawing is actually the brain. Where it says cerebral cortex, that's actually the brain. And then right on top of the brain is a yellow line. The yellow line is indicating the pia mater. And then there's all this white stuff, um, like uh, lines with uh, maybe some splaying out. That all of that is called the subarachnoid space. So the most superficial part of it, which is maybe like a burnt orange line, is the actual arachnoid mater. But underneath all that, is where we're going to be making the cerebral spinal fluid. And then we have uh, a gray just under the bone um, of the skull. There's a gray area and that's the tough mother, the dura mater, and that's what the Christi Galli is anchored to. And through this area is where we're going to have the venous, um, the venous return. We have some little sinuses right there. And if you can appreciate that that arachnoid, subarachnoid space has these outpouchings going into the sinuses, this is, um, this is where we're going to have um, cerebral spinal fluid that needs to be cleansed. It's going to dump into the sinuses, and those sinuses are eventually going to make it to the jugular vein, and all that blood is going to filter through the body, through the liver, and get it all cleaned up. So this is an epidural versus a spinal tap. An epidural, you actually, the white line that that needle is poking through is just a ligament. It's definitely a pop. You can definitely appreciate a pop. But you don't actually get into the meninges. And so meninges is, is central nervous system. It's not just the brain. You have a, that same connective cord or connective tissue wrap going down the spinal cord. Okay. So what they're doing is they're feeding like a, a rubber catheter through this needle. And this is where you can inject the anesthesia. So you're deadening the outside uh, area of the spinal cord or spinal nerves, whatever. Okay, but a spinal tap, if you need some fluid, you have to get past the dura mater into the subarachnoid space. So you're not just going through that ligament, you're actually going through the dura mater. And I hope you can appreciate how close we are getting to the spinal cord and how that's kind of a big deal. So um, a lot of times they'll try and do spinal taps um, and epidurals lower. Um, this, this spinal tap here is depicting um, that we're in the lumbar region because um, I'm going to show you in a little bit that the spinal cord 
stops actually kind of high in the lumbar area and then it starts um, it starts being not a cord but a it's called a horse's tail um, the cauda equina it's more like a whole bunch of strands of nervous tissue so hitting a strand of ner nervous tissue is not nearly as big of a deal as hitting a spinal cord so they'll go in the lumbar area Whenever you see the term itis, that's inflammation. So meningitis is inflammation of the meninges. Um, it can be anything. It can be virus. It can be bacterial. It can be fungal. It can be autoimmune. But um, virus and bacterial are definitely the most common. And uh, virus is actually least the least deadly usually. Bacteria, um, you have to get through something called the blood-brain barrier, which is created by really, really tight junctions in the capillaries, trying to protect the brain, but that also keeps antibiotics um, or some antibiotics from being able to get into um, the meninges to help protect it. Um, what else? Uh, one of the books, we've had three different books. One of the books actually talked about um, pinch, popping pimples on the side of your nose actually can shower bacteria into the facial vein and cause meningitis. So very interesting of note. I can't say that that happens a lot, but um, interesting nonetheless. Okay, ventricles. You have a total of four. You have two lateral ventricles and then you have the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. They constantly circulate cerebral spinal fluid through them. So each one of them has something called a choroid plexus, which is where those cells that we met, um, called ependymal cells, um, they are lining the ventricles and they are taking some of the blood vessels, filtering the plasma out creating the cerebral spinal fluid and putting it into the ventricles. All of that is happening. Each ventricle has its own choroid plexus. And then that cerebral spinal fluid, again, it's, it's mostly plasma, so therefore it's mostly water, but it does have some gases and electrolytes, a few small molecules. Um, the purpose of that cerebral spinal fluid, it's constantly circulating, so it's cushioning, it's keeping all those tissues moist, um, making sure that, okay, if we have any byproducts that need to be getting rid of, um, let's say you did have an encephalitis, so an inf infection of the brain tissue, um, hopefully you're helping clear out some of the toxins in the cerebral spinal fluid, because remember, it's going to dump into one of those venous sinuses, which is going to get into the jugular vein, which is going to get cleared as it enters circulation cleared by the liver and stuff. So it helps get rid of metabolic waste. Don't memorize this. Super cool picture though for you to understand how the flow of cerebral spinal fluid works. Notice that, um, okay, when we look at pictures of the spinal cord, there's a little hole in the middle of the butterfly. And down here towards the bottom of the picture, you see the term central canal. So that cerebral spinal fluid doesn't just go around the brain. It doesn't just go through the ventricle. It also goes down deep into the center of the spinal canal. So a lot of circulation, a lot of, um, um, a lot of flow, no stagnancy. And who is making all of this guy move? The little cilia are helping a ton on uh, by beating, they're helping a ton making all this fluid move. So again, not on the test, I'm not gonna ask you how cerebral spinal fluid um, flows, but can you envision what would happen if we blocked the cerebral spinal fluid's flow? So it's all being made in the ventricles thanks to the ependymal cells and it's flowing, but what would happen if you had a blockage? Let's say you had some sort of tumor buildup, maybe, maybe midway up your spinal cord. So you get no flow, 
Well, everything's going to back up behind the behind the pump, right? So the the choroid plexus and the pendulum cells is where all that's happening. And what's going to end up happening is those ventricles are just going to start getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You've probably heard of hydrocephalus. Okay, spinal cord. Opposite of the brain, the white matter is external and the gray, gray matter is internal. Um, I have pictures here in a minute of um, things from lab that you need to understand. The dorsal side, so the part that is um, closest to your back, the dorsal side is called the dorsal nerve root, and that is receiving sensory information. And then we have axons that are uh, leaving the ventral side of the spinal cord, and that's going to be motor. So the dorsal nerve root is sensory. The ventral nerve root, root is motor. Um, we mentioned in the lab book, ver intervertebral foramina. So in between each vertebrae, there is a passage where spinal nerves pass through. The actual cord, I just mentioned this, actually stops kind of high in the lumbar area. And then past that, it's called a cauda equina. It looks like a horse's tail. That's how it got its name. That's, that's Latin, cauda equina. And it's just a bundle of nerves. Um, the cord, um, uh, the cord does not actually reach the full length of the vertebral column, stopping it too. But what happens is it stops growing long before bones stop growing. So as bones keep growing, um, that's, that's why it doesn't go any further. So we've developed the majority of our spinal tissue growth very young, um, depending on which textbook you read, one to four years old. Um, but the bones keep growing. We get, we get taller in height. So that's why as an adult, our spinal cord stops kind of high. Skipping this. Okay, so here's a picture, a cross section of the spinal cord, and you can see where it says white matter on the outside, and then the butterfly part is gray matter. And then there's that little hole that I was talking about, the central canal, where the cerebral spinal fluid is passing through. There's a lot more words on here. Don't worry about that. But this you should worry about. So, this is... Um, Usually, I don't usually have this in the PowerPoint, but because we can't meet for lab right now, I want to be sure and point out the model. So you see the butterfly, and um, that's gray matter. The stuff around it is white matter, and then we have all these little cord-like things coming off of both the dorsal and the ventral side. Okay. Remember, cell bodies, for the most part, are in the central nervous system. The exceptions are in the periphery, wherever there is cell bodies, there's a ganglia. So here is actually a visual on a ganglia. That swelling on the dorsal root called the dorsal root ganglia. If you see the term ganglia, you should think cell bodies. And I've already pointed it out, that little Google map guy, he is um, sensory, so unipolar, Google Map dudes, are sensory. So are bipolar, but they are super rare. We're not going to talk about them for quite a while. So um, here's a ganglia, so therefore we know that there's cell bodies in there. Okay, And what's happening is as we receive information, it comes up is the dorsal side, it goes to the spinal cord, and if it's not reflex, like I talked about with the other PowerPoint where it's just the spinal cord does a reflex act, like the doctor hitting your knee and your knee should kick, you didn't think about that. If it's anything that you are going to sense and decide what to do about that sensation or acknowledge that sensation, it's now it's going to meet an association neuron at this area and go on up in, in the spinal cord and go on up to the brain. Okay, then your brain decides what to do with all that information. 
Maybe, maybe there was a spider on your arm and you sensed it and that information went up to your brain and maybe um, uh, at the thalamus, one branch went to the, your uh, parietal lobe and you sensed it and you are all ooked out and then you have another branch going to your um, frontal cortex that says swat the spider off. So we have to have motor output. So we're going to have an upper motor neuron at the, at the brain come down to this spinal cord at the ventral root. Now notice there's no ganglia. So the cell body is right there inside that gray matter. And now we have the neuron that goes to the neuromuscular junction that tells your hand to swat the spider off. So, dorsal root, you sense the spider. It goes up the dorsal root to the spinal cord. You're going to have an association neuron take it up to the brain. Your brain says, I really don't want that spider on me. I want you to swat it off. So then you have a connection. We're going to, the motor output is going to start up in the brain with an upper motor neuron coming down the spinal cord. So let's say at the cervical region, because you're going to use your hand, you're not going to go all the way down to your lumbar region. It's going to meet up with a lower motor neuron whose cell body is in the spinal cord because most cell bodies are in the spinal cord. And the axons are going to leave out that ventral root and go to your hand, and your hand's going to swat it. Now, remember, you have billions of nerves. So I'm simplifying it with motion of something that we can all relate to. You feel something, so you swat it. But remember, we also have motor nerves that are going to things that you're not in charge of. So turning your food, moving your gut, um, squeezing glands, you're not in charge of any of that. So that's going to be motor output too. This right here, I, uh, I'm showing you spinal nerves. So wherever that ventral root and dorsal root are is actually deep to these spinal nerves. The dorsal and the ventral roots actually come together to form these little spinal nerve branches. So the spinal nerve, all of them actually have both um, sensory and motor output and they get separated deep to this, closer to the spinal cord. See previous picture. Well, this is nice because you've actually already done this, but you don't realize you've already done this. This is the bundling of a nerve. So a nerve is just axons. Remember the cell bodies are either gonna be in the central nervous system or in a ganglia in the peripheral nervous system. A nerve is the name of the axons in the periphery. The axons in the brain are going to be called tracks. Okay, so um, this epineurium is going to be the connective tissue that goes around the whole nerve. But we have bundlings, just like with the muscle. And so bundlings of axons is going to be a fascicle wrapped by perineurium. That's nice. And then each individual axon is wrapped with endoneurium. So at least for once, that's, that's something that minimal to learn, right? So I blew this up right here. This is a fascicle, and you can see on the inside of the fascicle is all these little circles. All these little circles are axons. So individual axons from a neuron, and they're each wrapped with endoneurium. Now, I've, I've told you, you actually have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, well, billions of neurons, but we have thousands of nerves. So nerves are bundlings of neurons, okay? They do this weird 
uh, branching out, reorganization into new bundles. Um, and we have four major bundlings called a plexus. Um, so I have a picture on the next slide, but this one la labels out the different plex plexi that we have. And I have a couple of nerves that are bolded. So coming off of the spinal nerve C1 and C2, um, we're going to form a plexus called the cervical plexus. A very important branch of the cervical plexus is the phrenic nerve. And the reason is, notice he is, he is uh, associated with the neck, and his job is to innervate the diaphragm. So can you appreciate if you have severe enough damage to your neck, you can't breathe. If you're having surgery on your neck, you better have a good surgeon. Does that make sense? Because uh, if a phrenic nerve gets cut, can't breathe. Okay, and you got one on each side. All right, um, brachial plexus. Um, this is a this is an area, armpitish area. And if you have a small dog and you have ever picked up your small dog by his front legs and it went, ah, 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 that's because you're stretching his brachial plexus. Don't pick him up like that. Scoop him up underneath the belly. Okay, lumbar plexus. <laughs> is from all of the lumbar spinal nerves. Um, you've probably heard of your femoral nerve or your saphenous nerve, and that runs in the front of the leg. But the more common one that you hear about is further uh, inferior. So the last plexus is called the sacral plexus. It's going from L4 and 5 and then sacrum 1 through 4. That bundling has a major branch called the sciatic nerve. And it's going to produce pain down the back side of the leg. So if you have some sort of old lumbar injury or sacral injury, but lower lumbar is super, super common, um, you'll feel a referred pain going down your leg. So the problem being actually high, like right around the spinal cord, maybe one of those um, spinal nerves coming off in that area, but the pain is perceived as a shooting pain down the leg. Sciatica. Here's a picture of those plexi. So cervical plexus, brachial plexus, lumbar plexus, sacral plexus. Okay, so hiccups. Everybody's heard of hiccups. <laughs> well, the phrenic nerve is actually, um, you know, it's running from the diaphragm going upwards towards the neck and um, so superiorly and what's happening is that guy is getting irritated and so you're having a rhythmic contraction of the diaphragm so what causes that well something passing by the nerve actually is causing that so maybe um, eating too much distension of the stomach eating too fast um, uh, spicy foods. Um, and it usually has something to do with eating. So some sort of inflammation in the GI tract passing right by the nerve. Uh, definitely happens more with um, younger people and animals. Puppies get hiccups all the time. Um, and uh, <laughs> maybe we're just not used to all that, those kind of irritations. Aerophage is swallowing air. That's another weirdo. But anyway, harmless almost always. And then I included on here, both phrenic nerves are severed and the diaphragm becomes paralyzed. So you can't breathe. The only way you stay alive is a ventilator moves the air in and out for you. Here's that sciatica. Gosh, I didn't even remember I had these slides. <laughs> okay, so if you have hurt the lumbar part of your back, you're actually feeling uh, the shooting pain down the back of your leg. So um, it can also be from a disc herniation or rarely um, you get an injection in the wrong spot. So getting it too close to the sciatic nerve, um, there's definitely a way to give an injection. And you learn those kind of things in nursing school to make sure that you don't do something like this to somebody, but it's not impossible. 
Okay, so what about, I didn't mention T2 through T11. Why is that? Well, because those guys don't form a plexus. They're all going to go to the intercostal areas and help you breathe. So the areas between the ribs, because the external intercostal muscles help us take, take a breath along with the diaphragm. Now, if you're exercising and you're, you know, doing some really deep breathing, then we're going to have those internal intercostal muscles are going to help you make sure that you <laughs> get all the breath that you need. But usually the internal intercostals aren't working so hard to help you get a regular breath. But anyway, they all need nerves. Okay, so what happens if you cut uh, axons? Well, in the central nervous system, that's it. So you cut your spinal cord, all those um, axons in that area, that's it. You will, you will be paralyzed. But in the peripheral nervous system, there is hope. It depends on where the injury is. So you recognize that you feel when something is walking on your arm, right? So that is you're recognizing something um, with a branch of a neuron. So you're receiving that information. But remember, the cell body for sensation is all the way up by the spinal cord in that dorsal root ganglia. So you sense something on your arm and you're not paying any attention and you have a knife in your, in your hand and you think it's a spider and you swap the spider but you also cut your arm and sever those axons. Well, that end of that axon is going to die. But that's okay because we're going to have some macrophages to come and clean up that dead little fragment of an axon. And you still have Schwann cells proximal to that cut. And so what's going to happen is those Schwann cells can go through mitosis. The spinal cord is, I mean, the neuron itself can't go through mitosis, but he can branch. He can branch his processes. So what will happen is the Schwann cells go through multiplication and recreate a tube for filaments for processes to pass through. Okay? So... As long as you cut it fairly distal from the cell body, you can have regrowth. I burned the dorsal part of my uh, fingers when my oldest daughter was two, pretty significantly, second degree burns, the all top of my fingers. And I did not have sensation on the top of my fingers for about eight years. So I could touch them, but I, I couldn't feel what, that I was touching them. And um, they're normal now. Of course, my daughter is 26. So that's 24 years ago. It took a long time to fill the top of my hands. So it just takes time to rebranch um, processes um, in the periphery, not the central nervous system. Central nervous system, that's it. You cut those fibers, that's it. But in the periphery, as long as you have some Schwann cells, and as long as you're not cutting too close to the cell body. If you're cutting too close to the cell body, that's it. It's not going to regrow. Um, you're going to lose too much cytoplasm or axoplasm, and the cell's just going to essentially deflate like a balloon. And that's it. It's just a picture showing. As long as the cut is far enough away from the cell body. Cranial nerves. Okay. This is a list of the different cranial nerves. And one thing to help you memorize um, their names is this mnemonic on the right. So um, number one is olfactory. It starts with an O. Number two is optic. starts with an O. You get the idea. So, oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly. So, test question might be, I have this symptom, I have these symptoms, which cranial nerves might be affected, just for example. 
Okay, cranial nerves. Remember, they're called nerves, not tracts. So that means that that is in the periphery. So even though they're coming um, off of the brain, they're peripheral. They're not brain. They're not spinal cord. They're peripheral nervous system. So some of them carry just sensory neurons. Some of them carry just motor. And some of them carry both. So to help you remember, and this is in your lab book, to help you remember um, which is which, there's a mnemonic here. So some saps marry money, but my brother says bad business marry money, or my, my, whatever. If it's an S, it's sensory. If it's an M, it's motor. If it's B, it's both. Okie dokie. So that, I can't help you with too much. It's, that's rote memorization. But, um... I can tell you, you will not have to do what this picture is right here, except for a couple of neurons, um, a couple of nerves. So in your lab book, I'm remembering that it says the most important cranial nerves for you to know for your lab book um, is number one, number two, number eight, number ten, and maybe five because he's so big. I don't remember him ever pointing to something like this and saying, what nerve is this as far as trigeminal goes, number five. But he definitely could point to olfactory. He definitely could point to um, optic. And we'll get into that in a little bit more depth um, in a bit. Definitely could also point to um, cranial nerve eight. Okay, so cranial nerve one for for lab and for lecture. This guy makes you smell. So he's sensory. He's just sensory. As we get older, things don't do as good as they used to, and neurons actually can die off. So senior citizens might suffer from anosmia. And remember, this is the great kind of fill in the blank questions. Things that you can, why am I learning this? Well, here's why. Because this could happen to you. This could happen to your patients. And uh, senior citizens, um, especially if they have a lot of chronic illness, they might be having a hard time um, taking in enough food. Well, if you can't smell, you can't taste. They're linked together in the brain. So why would you want to eat? Why would you have a desire to eat? If you don't smell food, now, yes, you might get hungry, but the pleasure of eating is gone. So it's a real challenge for people with anosmia. Optic is going to be for vision. So this would only be sensory as well. Now here we're getting optic, sensory, um, smell, sensory. Do you remember what I said about special senses? So hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting. This is where um, bipolar neurons are going to show up. So the optic nerve is for sight. The oculomotor is just motor. Helpful that the term motor is in there. So we have six eye muscles that are going directly to the eye, and the oculomotor is in charge of four of them. So he helps you raise your eyelid, um, he actually helps do things that you're not in charge of. So your iris is going to, when that guy contracts and relaxes, it changes the shape of your pupil. Um, your, you have ciliary muscle that's controlling your lens shape. So as we get older, that lens gets a little bit tougher. And so your lens shape doesn't adjust. Why do you need to adjust your lens? Well, are you trying to look up close? Or are you trying to look far away? So your oculomotor ner nerve is in charge of your lens as well. In Lanyap, I have a picture of the eye with all of those muscles that are attaching to the globe. So inferior, superior, oblique, the rectus muscles. Um, anyway, so the oculomotor is in charge of four of those eye muscles. The inferior oblique, medial rectus, inferior rectus, and the superior rectus. This guy, he has one job, the trochlear nerve. He is in charge of only 
the superior oblique muscle. Make that my core. He's called the trochlea because he actually swings over a ligament. Um, anyway, too much information. Okay, the trigeminal nerve. He is the largest of the cranial nerves. If you go back and look at that picture, you'll see that he's quite big and fat. And he gets his name trigeminal because he has three divisions. And he's doing a large portion of the face, nose, cheeks. Um, in your lab book, there is a thing to test the sensory part. So trigeminal is both motor and sensory. Sensory, And we had cotton balls. And you tell your partner to close their eyes and stroke, you stroke a dry cotton ball on their cheek. And then you strike a wet cotton ball on their cheek. And they should be able to tell the difference. And that's because of this trigeminal nerve. Look at all that that guy does. That's a bunch. Oh, look, a ganglion. What's inside of a ganglion? Cell bodies. The abducens, he also only has one job. <laughs> he is going to go to the lateral rectus of the eye, and he gets his name abducens because he abducts the eye. He makes the eye go away from midline. So when that lateral, mus lateral rectus muscle contracts, it pulls the eye laterally, so you look laterally. That's his job. Cranial nerve seven, he does both sensory and um, motor. He helps you make a lot of your facial expressions, but he's also in charge of moving your glands to cry, moving your glands to salivate. And he, as far as sensory, he helps you taste things with the most uh, most of your tongue, the anterior two-thirds of your tongue. Okay, this guy sure could show up on the lab test. Um, he is going to be the vestibulocochlear nerve. It's number eight. And um, he's going to branch once he gets into the inner ear. Part of it's going to go to the cochlea and part of it's going to go to the, sensor, to the semicircular canals. Um... So he's sensory. He's just sensory. Glossopharyngeal is both sensory and motor. So he does the other, the back portion of your tongue's taste. So one third. But he also innervates, he helps you move your tongue. He helps you swallow. Um, he does some of your salivary glands. Um, and you don't even need to know the stylopharyngeal muscle. That's all part of swallowing. Okay, this guy is major for the autonomic nervous system. The majority of your per, um, parasympathetic um, nervous system is going to be run by this guy, the vagus nerve. He's number 10. He is the only cranial nerve that goes beyond your head and neck. So he's going to dip down into your chest and he's going to inter innervate your heart and your lungs. He's even going to have branches that go a little bit further down into your gut. Super, super, super important guy. The accessory nerve is a motor nerve, and he's going to go to a couple of muscles that hopefully you know by now, the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid. So he helps innervate those guys. And then finally, cranial nerve 12. Can you roll your tongue? Can you flip your tongue? Can you talk? Can you swallow? This is all part of the hypoglossal 